the blue lunules here on the small tortoise shell, but also the ragged shape. Now somebody posted a broomstone the other day which was worn and battered, um, which had a ragged shape, but this butterfly, the comma, is this shape even when it's pristine. The underside of these species can be trickier. We saw the underside of the painted lady just now, so you all know that it's the wing tip here with the white spots that identifies it. None of the others look have a little arc or circle of white spots. But the comma, still got the same outline of course, is reasonably dark here and paler. The tortoise shell is much darker and paler. And the peacock is also dark, but not as dark as the tortoise shell and not as pale as the comma. But I would think one of the things that distinguishes them is this border between the two contrasted areas. Look how jagged this is, rather like the edge of the wing. And the tortoise shell is also quite undulating here, whereas the peacock, compared with the other two, is relatively straight. The blue lunules on the tortoise shell show through even on the underside. So the undersides of these three are uh, undoubtedly trickier to identify than the upper sides. But if you just get an idea of the difference between the contrast and this contrast line here, the border between the contrast areas, then I think that really will help. The blue lunules, if you can see them, are an absolute clincher for small tortoise shell and obviously this wavy outline, if you can see it, for the comma compared with the less wavy outline of the peacock and the tortoise shell. And I just put the speckled wood in because it's a brown butterfly, slightly different family group to these three, but it's similar enough that you might see something brown settled and not be absolutely sure. I hope you can see eye spots. And also the way that these veins are very prominent, not at all obvious on these butterflies. You can just about see some veins here, but they're not standing out in the same way as the speckled wood. So the eyes and the veins on the speckled wood distinguish it for me pretty quickly as not being in the same group as those. Nick, okay. just before, Nick, yep, just sorry, before you move it, um, what I was saying in terms of your sound, I wonder if your microphone could be, is a little bit moving a little bit further off your mouth. It's coming across a little bit tinny and a bit muffled. A bit muffled. Okay, shall I try moving back a bit? Is that I'm better? not sure if that's gonna or if it's the way the microphone is near your mouth, but don't worry too much if it fiddle about. But um I think we're okay hearing it. It's just a bit muffled, a bit tinny with one or two okay, of us. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll I'll try to speak more clearly. I, 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 I think can't it's move the microphone, I can just move me. The microphone's actually in the camera. In which case, don't worry, don't worry. Carry on. Sorry, Nick. That's all right. No, thank you for telling me. Okay, I'm sorry folks, I'll do my best to be clear, to enunciate clearly, that'll help. So, we're on to the confusing species, fritillaries. Now, quite often these simply fly past and they don't stop, but even so, you might be able to see the pointy wingtips on the silver washed, very pointy, and the rounded wingtips of the dark green. If you see a female dark green, you will also very likely be able to see these very pale lunules here compared with the lunules here, which are the same orange as the rest of the forewing and hindwing. And that actually stands out quite well in the field, assuming that you're very close to the butterflies when they fly past you. If they settle, then this shape compared with this pointy shape, should be really obvious. Plus, the silver washed, as I've said here, is stripy. The male has obvious black stripes along the veins. They can be much more obvious than even this picture shows. Whereas the dark green, it tends to look more spotty and dotty, and particularly on the underside. So on the underside, you can see stripes of silver or white, and you can see that it looks rather like it's been washed with something, sort of slightly washed out, and I've heard it described as looking like lines of salt left behind on the beach when the tide goes out. 
So that's where the silver washed comes from. But once again, you can see how much pointier the wing edges are than this rounded dark green, which is the dotty grassland fritillary. So this isn't 100% certain, and I would think perhaps 80% of the time, silver wash fritillaries are in woodland. They might be on the edge of it, but they're normally in the woodland. And the dark green, 95% of the time, are in grassland. It's very rare to see them in a wood. It does happen, but it's very rare. So if you're in a wood and there's a large orange fritillary flying about, it's most likely silver washed. If you're on grassland, a big open area of grass, and there's a, silver, uh, a fritillary flying about, it's probably a dark green. The dark green or dotty grassland far more likely to fly about without stopping. They do stop and they nectar from knapweeds and thistles, but they don't stop very often. The silver washed, far more likely to be stopping and nectaring on brambles, on thistles, all sorts of flowers, particularly brambles and thistles. And it actually glides around looking for flowers, whereas the dark green doesn't really seem to do that to anything like the same extent. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, another butterfly which we've already mentioned, a speckled wood, also seen in woodlands, but really very different. Much darker chocolate brown with pale, creamy coloured dots on the wing. Nothing like the fritillaries, so I don't think you'd have any trouble. I mean, this is smaller as well than both those fritillaries, but I have known people wonder if this is a fritillary. Um, I'm sure none of you will make that mistake. Okay, is the, the sound quality any better, Nick? It's pretty similar, but I'm I'm okay with it, and no one else at the moment is saying so. I think I think you're good okay. to carry on, Nick. Don't worry about it too much. Okay, yeah. I just think I'll, I'll just check the USB connection in case. No, that's fine. I thought perhaps it wasn't connected as well as it might be, but I, I, I think you're fine. Anyway, you're we'll fine. carry on and hope yeah, thank that you. people can make it out. Okay, two more butterflies in this family, which really can be quite tricky if you see them high in the trees. Purple Emperor on the left here, and the White Apple on the right. Now, I did mention, in addition to wing edges, we want to look at eyes. The Purple Emperor has eyes here, and I'll just go to the next slide briefly, and it has two eyes on the underside, whereas the White Admiral has no eyes at all. So eyes with pupils on the Purple Emperor, no eyes on the White Admiral. In terms of the amount of white, they are actually quite similar. You will have noticed if you've been looking that there is an extra white spot on the Purple Emperor, two spots here, look, only one on the White Admiral just here. So Purple Emperor's got an extra white spot. But I think the easiest way to tell them apart actually is from their behavior you will most likely see both of these butterflies flying around. You might be lucky and they're stopped. But the way they fly is quite different. The purple emperor tends to be above the treetops. The male purple emperor tends to be above the treetops. And as I've said here, a more determined, forceful flight. It doesn't look particularly hurried in its wing beats, but it's obviously powerful. And it's cruising across the tops of the trees. The white admiral might be that high, but it's much more likely to be flying at around about head height, possibly even lower. And I've described it as recalling a sparrow hawk's flight because you'll see a few fairly rapid wing beats and then a long glide, followed by a few beats and a glide. The purple emperor doesn't do much gliding. The white admiral does. And the white admiral very often flies along a ride or the edge of a wood, and then it does a handbrake turn and comes straight back the way it just went. The Purple Emperor very rarely does that. It tends to be going in one direction and it keeps going. It might turn. If it sees another Purple Emperor, it will definitely turn towards it, but it doesn't have a patrolling behavior where it goes up and down the same little bit of woodland over and over. This butterfly does. So it flies with the White Admiral, that is, flies with some rapid beats and a glide, 
and then it turns round very sharply and comes straight back the way it just went and then it turns and goes back again and if you find a white admiral on its territory it will tend to be going up and down that same ride for several days the purple emperors have trees that they favor the tallest trees in a, an area and ones which are quite sheltered usually and they will launch out from there and go in on big circuits around the tree tops but they don't really make a sort of a linear path up and down the edge of a ride so i hope that's helpful um, size is not especially helpful though because the male purple emperor isn't much different in size to the female white admiral and because they're both very often fairly high up it's difficult to get an exact fix on how big they are a female purple emperor usually you can tell my word that's big but the male purple emperor isn't anything like as big and the female white admiral gets close in size to the male purple emperor okay let's look at the undersides unfortunately all too often they're sitting in a tree and they're a long way up binoculars are definitely useful even a telescope can help provided you can see through the foliage with it and we're looking for the eye spots on the purple emperor or we're looking for this area of white which you can see here is pale gray but nothing like as obviously white as the white admiral the white admiral doesn't normally sit very high in the trees. The white admiral is more likely to be a bit lower, but still probably binocular range, depending on the woodland. So the purple emperor, if you can see one high up, look for these eyes and the color here. If the butterfly is fairly high up and you can see clearly that there's a large white area here, very pale, and no obvious eyes, then obviously that's a white admiral. Just to mention the behavior of the females, they both surprisingly spend female purple emperor and white admiral spend more time in the shade than they do in the sun. They are quite happy flying around in the shade for long periods. And the female white admiral may well spend you know, hours at a time in the shade looking for honeysuckle that's the food plant of the caterpillar of the white admiral and they only live on honeysuckle growing in shade so you'll see white admirals quite deep inside woodland even conifer woodland in complete shade and those are females normally searching out the honeysuckle the female purple emperor lays her eggs on sallow the plant that has catkins pussy willow stuff and that is also shady but it will fly down sunlit rides on the side where the sallows are in the shade it's a nice bit of alliteration but anyway so the purple emperor you might see a female flying at about head height slightly higher down a woodland ride but she will investigate the sallows and the shady side of those plants the white admiral, when you see it flying around, the female will be investigating honeysuckle, which is a very good clue to which species you're looking at. Okay, I think we're probably finished with the, yes we are, the nymphalid. So are there any questions at this point, Nick, that you'd like me to address? There's none that have come up yet, Nick, okay. but um, I'm happy to say it's just a quick question on purple imp and wild admiral and, and their woodland preferences. I guess from a children's perspective, typical woodland in Chilterns with um, a more open beech wood and less understory. I guess less likely to get purple emperor and white admiral in the Chilterns woodlands than you would maybe in, in some in the Vale. But You're absolutely right. I dealt with them because we do get purple emperor actually more often than white admiral uh, seen in the Chilterns mm -hmm. and there, there will undoubtedly, well, once we get some decent weather again, there mm -hmm. will be purple emperors flying in the Chilterns next week I think and okay. definitely for a, you know, a couple more weeks after that. Okay. White apple is much more restricted and I think it must be that there just isn't the amount of honeysuckle in Chiltern woodlands. We get a lot of holly in the understory, don't we? We don't get yep. so much honeysuckle. Yep. So they both exist. The white admiral, very scarce, the purple emperor scarce, but it is seen. And if you are doing your bits of um, wider countryside butterfly survey anywhere where there's 
fair block of, fair, of quite tall woodland, it's worth keeping an eye open for these species. Quite likely they'll be off transect, but they're always good to see anyway. And a couple of questions think, next, uh, have popped up now in the chat. Um, yep. Francesca's asked, could you repeat the food plant for the Purple Emperor, please? Yes, sallow, which some people call pussy willow. It's a it's type of willow, willow yeah. which has big fluffy catkins. Yep, and from Fiona, I'm assuming Fiona you're talking about the Purple Emperor, but if I'm wrong, correct me. Um, she's asking, is the female bigger than the male? Did you say? In, in most butterflies, the female is bigger than the male. Okay. They, they've always got larger bodies, and they've usually got slightly larger wings as well to carry the extra weight. Okay, sounds good. And a qu uh, comment, as opposed to a question from George, saying that the National Trust wardens um, saw Purple Emperor Ashridge last summer. So I guess Ashridge would be a, a good hotspot for them. But. Yes, I mean, I'm always surprised there aren't white admirals quite commonly at ash ridge because there is areas in there with honeysuckle but it's very scarce up there it's hardly ever seen purple mm -hmm. emperor is seen on an annual basis all along the canal from trim to uh, burk hampstead and it does definitely get up uh, into the ash ridge on one side ash ridge forest one side and up into the wendover woods on the other side mm -hmm. so yeah definitely it's it's there every year it's just a matter of being in the right place where there's a gap in the canopy as it as it flies over, you happen to see it. Yeah, yeah. It's just a matter of luck, really. Good stuff. Okay, we'll carry Thank on. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Yep. Hmm? So we're into the the whites, and we'll deal with these two first. Now, I've already put this slide up in the spring show, so we're not going to make a big fuss. But just to remind you that if you see the much darker yellow when it's flying, it looks more custard coloured and less lemony. But these white spots inside the brown on the hind wing and the black spot there are something you will never see on a brimstone it always has these orangey little well, brown crap spots which fade anyway with time and become even less obvious but those are always obvious and of course you've got assuming it isn't like the brimstone we saw on the whatsapp page the other day it has these pointy corners which help to identify them um, just to quickly go through these again, and I really do mean quickly, small white, small amount of grey scales here, they don't really go down this wing edge, large white, large amount of black scales that do come down this wing edge, giving you the shape of an L. This is a male, because it's a single spot, and this female, because it's got two spots in the beginning of a stripe that we can't really see. The female brimstone looks like a white when she's flying because she's so pale but we've still got these pointy tips and we've still got those two little orangey spots. The green veined white which can be so easily confused with a small white in flight can be identified by the vein endings which always have these little triangular or chevron marks right at the tips as it crosses this edge of the forewing. And this one, I'm just going to pause for a moment while you all consider which sex is this? Is it male or female? Well, you had a 50% chance of getting it right, and I'm hoping everyone said female, because we've got two spots and a streak. Okay, the undersides, again, I think, once you know what you're looking for, fairly straightforward. Small white, a hint of the grey on the upper wing showing through as a faint yellowish mark there. A lot of grey here, look, in the lower part of the hind wing. Grey scales on top of the yellow. Here, with the green veined white, these grey scales are along the veins. They're not distributed sort of mostly here or mostly there. They're all over along the veins. And the large white, very little grey scaling on the forewing, but the hind wing, even amounts. And of course, you can see this large black mark on the upper wing, through the wing, it stands out quite clearly. I think it's probably true to say that in the female large white, and this one is a female large white, that black spot is much bigger as a relative proportion of the wing surface than it would be if this was a female small white or this a female green veined but 
you don't really need to look for the size of the spots in trying to work out the relative size. Look for this L-shaped mark showing through on the large, even spread of the gray. No sign of that L shape on the small, and most of the gray in the basal part, the, no, I don't mean basal, the lower half of the hind wing. But with the green vein white, the gray tends to be spread evenly around all the veins, forewing and lower wing, or, um, forewing and hind wing. Nick, before okay, you move on, yeah, definitely. Um, sorry, back as far as well. Pete's okay. asked um, about the clouded yellow. Um, yeah. is, and is it a characteristic of the cloudy yellow? It's it's fast flight. Is that a kind of a, a, a jizz ID for, for cloudy yellow? Yes, but um, I think brimstones probably can go quite fast. I think the dark yellow colour coupled with a fast and very direct flight probably is a, a good clue. Okay, so it's one of a series, but not on its own. Yep. Okay. No, it's not the only thing that would identify it, yep. but it's a, it's a good clue, definitely. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Okay, we're into another different group now. Um, small copper, we looked at it before. I thought I'd just go over, because now you're at walking your wider countryside butterfly survey, you are going to see, I hope, small copper and small heath, and they do look similar, don't they? And I can see that people might, if they didn't get a very good look, be unsure of which species. So I would say I'm changing my story here slightly. You could look at the wing edge where this is a sort of uniform gray and this obviously has an orange wing edge but I think this white mark here separating the two halves of the wing, this one's sort of orangey on the edge and then all gray, this one's gray on the outside, darker on the inside but that white line there always stands out really clearly in the field. So you should be able to see that, and that would tell you for certain whether you were looking at a small heath or a small copper. Small heath with this white stripe, just there. Okay, we'll move on. This is um, something that I don't think very many of you are gonna to need to worry about, except that people often get to think, maybe I did see a silver spotted skipper it's one of those bit like I said about the Adonis blue. If you do see one, you tend to know it. And if you think you might have done, you probably didn't. But the large skipper, we can see a contrast between this orange near the body and a darker olive brown near the wing edge. And faint orange spots, the same color as the ground color here in that olive brown. The silver spotted skipper these are creamy colored. They're not orange like they are here, as you can see when I pointed out. These are much paler. But the underside is the clincher. The underside of a large skipper is often so poorly marked with these faint spots that you almost struggle to see them at all. The silver spotted skipper is always really clearly marked on the hind wing with this pattern very bright gleaming white spots. I wouldn't have called them silver, but very, very bright white spots. Now, these three here, that is three spots actually, this one's coalesced together in this particular individual's markings, but three spots here are always present on a silver spotted skipper and they're always really obviously white. Sometimes with a large skipper, these spots, can be quite bright, pale yellow, and contrasted against the rest of the body, but there are never three white spots here. So once again, we're moving away summer butterflies from the wing edge for this particular identification. Large skipper, much less obvious pale markings on a dark background. These dots are the same color orange as the forewing, near the body, whereas these are obviously much paler than the color of the forewing near the body. And on the hind wing, the real clincher, this butterfly, the spots are usually very hard to see, but if they are quite well contrasted, it's only these outer ones and not the inner spots here, which are very much better contrast. 
Um, I don't know if I've put it here, yes I have, about the behaviour. You hardly ever see a silver spotted skipper fly above 10 centimetres and they whir around with a tremendous energy, really forceful little creatures. Whereas these are much happier flying about quite high and you could well see them fly over a hedge. You know, from not because they've been scared off or something, but because they choose to. They'll nectar on brambles up in a hedge. They'll fly across hedges and perch on top of a hedge. So they're much more able and willing to fly quite high. They regularly go up to the top of creeping thistles. This butterfly would very, very rarely go to anything as high as that. This one's up on a scabious, and that's quite unusual for a silver spotted skipper. It's normally the ground thistle that it goes to and other plants down on the floor. So as I say, most people aren't going to see a silver spotted skipper on their wider countryside butterfly survey, but just occasionally they turn up in strange places, so it's worth knowing the difference. Nick, a couple of questions on the skippers while we're still on them. Yep. Um, first one from Francesca, uh, just confirming that on your on the bottom left photo of the large skipper, yeah, we're, we're assuming that the, the it's the proboscis that's curled, curled around in the top, coming out the top of its head. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, excellent. Good work, Michael. Good work, Francesca, on the chat. And then a question from Tim: um, Are there any? Well, a a what kind of habitat um, would you like to find the skippers in? And there are they kind of more? And does, is could habitat be a clue to the ID? Well, it is a clue. The large skipper is woodland edge fairly big overgrown hedgerows and rough tall grass fields. Mm -hmm. You don't often find large skipper on short chalk downland, but you do find the silver spotted skipper on short chalk downland as its primary habitat. However, in recent years, they've been managing to branch out, as it were, away from their traditional habitat and explore new areas. So silver spotted skippers have been seen in the Chilterns away from chalk downland. Okay. Normally, if you were going to look to get a photo of a silver spotted skipper, you'd go to somewhere like Euston Bank or Aston Road, where there's a very short turf, and then you'd find your silver spotted skippers. Um, large skipper, you'd be looking more like uh, the sorts of habitat you get, say, at Butler's Hangings or um, Coombe Hill, Wendover Ware you've got quite a bit of scrub on the hillside, so there's rough edges with taller grasses. You very rarely find silver spotted skipper anywhere with long grass, okay. but you can unfortunately say, so, yes, it's a general rule, woodland edge by the side of a thick hedge in long grass, very short grass, almost non-existent grass for the silver spotted skipper. And Nick Building on that as well, a question from Pete around, um, you can confirm the main food plants for both for both species for their caterpillars. Well, the large skip has got a whole variety of different grasses. I think Coxwood is often given, Yorkshire Fog is, is another one. The silver spotted skipper is completely restricted to the sheep's fescue. So they're both grasses then as opposed to flowers? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, okay, yep. yep. Thank you. And then we'll go on to a slightly tricky combination as if the last two weren't, but here we are with the small skipper and the Essex skipper. <laughs> and the one thing that really is helpful is to see the antenna. And I'm hoping that these pictures show you, here we've got an orangey tip, and here we've got a black tip. Now, just to go back, because someone was getting confused about this the other day, and I forget whether it was an email I was sent, I think it was an email actually, not WhatsApp, but there is a black tip on the large skipper as well. The large skipper's black tip though, if you can see on this antenna here, and this one here perhaps, like if we could expand it bigger, but we can't, then there is a little point. The black tip of the Essex skipper is completely blunt. There is no point to it. And the black tip on the Essex skipper is really contrasted against the orange of the stem of the antenna, which has some little black bands, but it's the same color orange all the way. The small skipper usually, and this one's slightly exceptional, I think, but usually gets gradually darker and there is obviously less contrast. I mean, this one's only orange at the end anyway. 
sometimes so you will see small skippers with a darker uh, final tip area here but there's a gradual change from orangey through brown to darker whereas here it's always really abrupt there's an obvious black tip and then an orangey stem and to tell this butterfly the Essex skipper with its black tip from the large skipper is the fact that the whole of the underside is completely unmarked it's uniform the whole thing is the same color completely the small skipper is pretty much that except there is a slight difference in the tips there are no spots on either so the large skipper had these faint spots neither of these have spots at all no spots at all on the upper surface if we see males of the species the small skipper unfortunately it doesn't go with the word small has a larger mark just here and the Essex skipper has a much shorter one so these have been badly named if we're trying to remember it because we should have a short small and we should have this should be the extremely long Essex or something but it's the wrong way around so you have to remember I'm afraid small skipper a longer slightly curved scent mark and the Essex a much shorter a much more abrupt scent mark here so Nick so, the name the name yeah. Essex sorry I'm assuming that is, no, is is not a clue to its range we're, we're perfectly within its range in the Chilterns but both these butterflies are throughout the Chilterns yeah so Essex it's, is a bit of a red herring then yeah yeah. Well, it's just named Essex because that's where people first realised it was a separate species. Got you. Um, and again, both of them have caterpillars that feed on grasses, and they both feed on similar grasses. But the Essex skipper prefers um, a turf where the grasses are rather sparse, where there's a bit more bare ground, and where the grasses are not dominant because they've been fertilised. So you're very unlikely to see Essex skipper in a pasture that's been fertilized to improve it for any sort of grazing stock whereas the small skipper can cope with that type of habitat so the small skipper you might well see in a paddock with a few horses or an area where there's sheep or cows because it can cope with a very dense turf but the Essex skipper is more likely in rough bits if there's a field margin it might be there road verges because nobody deliberately fertilizes road verges are good for Essex skippers where the turf is a bit more sparse but they're both prolific um, and ubiquitous right across the Chilterns it'd be quite surprising if you managed to have a um, when you do your two kilometers one kilometer out and one kilometer back walk if you don't at some point come across both seas I would expect them to be in every um, one case where on Okay. on the Chilterns unless you're in really dense woodland it couldn't cope with that but um, the edges of the woodland would probably have them anyway. And a question okay. Nick on the skipper yep. still from Pete um, is the small skipper the same as so it's what's colloquially known as the common skipper? I've never heard of a common skipper okay so that may be colloquial but I'm afraid it's missed me I don't think there is such a thing as a common skipper these two are sometimes referred to as smessix from Small and Essex because you can record them on your wider countryside form as a single species because people at the recording end realize they're very difficult to tell apart because they're quite small, they're rapidly moving and you might not see them settled. So you can just record them as a group yeah. of Smessex, Small and Essex together. But I don't think there is a common skipper. Sorry. There you go, Pete. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Right, we're onto the browns. And these might superficially appear to be slightly tricky, but actually they're very simple. You'll soon get the hang of this. Meadow brown, male and female here. The only difference between them is that the female is paler. It's got a much bigger pale area around the black and white centered eye spot. So that tiny orange mark on the male is much bigger in the female and the whole ground colour tends to be paler. So male, female, meadow browns. And they are the only brown species apart from the small heath with a single white pupil. 
but the small heath never sits with its wings open. It always folds up and is closed. You only ever see the underside. And we will remember, because we saw it earlier today, it has a white streak across the hind wing, which we can't see in this because we're looking at a different species. The ringlet has many eye spots and every single one of them has this creamy halo. No such thing here, these are orangey at best and they're certainly not creamy. And the outer edge, we're back to wing edges, hooray! A really obvious contrast between this which is whiter against the dark chocolate ground colour. This is grey, pale grey I give you, but it's grey against a, a lighter sort of milk chocolate colour. So that contrast really stands out and you can see that sometimes before the butterfly has settled and you see the eye spots. So if it flies past you, they do look, the male meadow brown and the ringlet do look very similar in flight, but if you can see that contrasting edge, then that will tell you which one you've seen. The eye spots though are a total giveaway. And I just threw the speckled wood in, we've seen it three times now. But the speckled wood, plenty of eye spots, but look at the size of these halos, shall we call them? These spots are much bigger and they're far more extensive, many of them without any eye spots in them. So the eye spots on the ringlet each has a halo, but there are no other spots which have no eyes, eyes within them. Okay, and we look at the undersides. The meadow brown, the male and the female look the same, so I've not bothered with both. A single white pupil in a single eye spot. Similar in the small heath, as I said, but it's got this pale area here, separating the dark from the outer edge. That always stands out. Here, there's a white band or a pale band, but it's nothing like this contrast here. Much bigger band. And a grey edge to the small heath, not the same there, really. I think just the size alone actually would tell you that these were separate species. This is twice the size of the small heath. Ringlet, halos around these eye spots. And again, the contrast of the white to the dark chocolate and the speckled wood. Fourth time it's been in now, it's probably going to win the most frequently featured. Um, lots of eye spots and prominent veins. And one more white coloured brown to include here. This is a member of the brown family, the marbled white. All these browns, by the way, are feeding on grasses, including the marbled white and the marbled white shouldn't present any problem, I think. It's such an obviously contrasted butterfly. Again, we've got some eye spots, more obvious on the underside. Um, and the only thing I think we could possibly confuse it with is the green veined white, but you can see as soon as it's pointed out, here the gray color goes along the veins from the body out to the edge of the wing. And here the gray colors go in bands across the wings. So at 90 degrees to the way that the green vein whites go. So these are across the wings from top to bottom, and these are across the wings from body to wing edge. Any questions on the browns there, Nick? None that have come in yet, but if anyone's got one, feel free to, to fire away. No, Brilliant. I think Nick, crack on. If, if any pop up, I'll, I'll bring yeah, you back. Yeah, we can no. always go back. We can yeah. go back. It's just that none, I, none so far. None so I like to take them when they come up because it seems more relevant then. Yeah. Um, here we go then. We've seen the common blue and the holly blue, so I'm not going to dwell on them. Wing edges. The margin is cut by black veins in the holly blue. A completely clear margin, a clear border on the common blue, and the fact that you've got red lunules here, they're more orangey in this specimen, but red-orange lunules here, and no lunules at all of any sort, but certainly no red or orange on the holly blue. There is a possibility, and some of you will find the small blue when you're out walking in the Chilterns, that you could mix up a holly blue, if it's come down to ground level, 
with a small blue. Small blues very rarely settle high in bushes. They will settle in bushes, but not normally above shoulder height. Holly blues are very likely to be seen above shoulder height and very rarely seen down at ground level, except in very dry weather. So this spring they were down looking for moisture. But we can see, I hope, no red lunules, which is where the confusion comes in. But look at this, the holly blue is actually a blue, blue butterfly. The male and female are blue. The small blue is so dark, almost black. Very, very few bluish scales, a few near the body on both the top surface and the under wings, just a hint of blue. They look blue when they fly because the way the light catches the two wings as they open and close makes them look, look bluish, but when they settle it's obviously very dark. And if you see the underside, each one of these dots is circled with a little white halo. White ringed black dots, no white wings and streaks on the holly blue. Moving on. A couple of questions, Nick, on food plants, yeah, sure. if we can. Um, yeah. One around the small blue. Um, am I right in thinking small blue is um, more associated with kidney vetch? It is completely, completely kidney. It, it can't feed, caterpillars can't feed on anything else. Anything but kidney vetch. Okay, so that's keep right. your eye out for kidney vetch then, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yes, if you see a small blue, it's often on kidney vetch. If mm -hmm. you see one a long way away from where it normally breeds, it might not be, but if it's somewhere near where it breeds, there's usually kidney vetch very close by. And, and a question on small, and similar to the same question, but for um, small heath. Yep. Grasses. And again, they're, gra they're grasses. Grasses. Yeah, all, all the brands, just to go back to them, all these brands feed on grasses. Okay. Which is why, if you can bring yourself to throw away your mower and pour the petrol that you might have had for your strimmer all over it and set fire to it, these will then start breeding in your garden. It's really common to get meadow bran, ringlet, possibly speckled wood if you've got some shade and marbled white breeding in gardens. You just have to stop cutting the grass. Okay. Small heath's a bit trickier because it needs areas of naturally short grass, which means a very poor quality soil for the small heath. But it's doing quite well this spring and so it might turn up in your garden just as it's exploring for new habitat. Thank you. Um, common blue brown argus. We looked at these before. I expect you all remember it, so I'll just go very quickly. Checkered margins, the veins come through the white margins on a brown argus. The brown argus always looks like, as my friend Graham Hawker describes, it's just bought a new outfit to go to a wedding, whereas the common blue looks like it's worn that outfit many times previously and it's just trying to wear it out so it can justify buying something new. So this always looks slightly dowdier, completely clear borders on a common blue. And this is a female, we can tell because it's mostly brown. The brown argus, males and females look like this. So there is never a blue brown argus, but there are brown common blues, strangely enough. The undersides are the very easiest way to tell the, the common blue female from the brown argus, because the brown argus We've swapped sides now, which is a bit silly in this slide, but this is the brown argus here with its two spots close together, making a figure eight or a colon shape. And then down here, there's a bare area. The brown argus has a bare area where the common blue has a spot. But that spot there, no, I beg your pardon, this spot here has not moved down to be close to that one. So there's a, a question mark shape there. We've been through all this, and of course you can see the veins going through the margins on the brown argus. Now it's possible that some of you are going to come across Adonis blue in the Chilterns, and they were flying, uh, probably still are flying if the weather settles down again for a few more days before they come back in late summer. They have two broods in the year, and they'll be back again in August. And Again, the difference between the common blue and the Adonis blue, to be absolutely certain of your identification, are these black veins going through the borders. So the holly blue, if we go right the way back to it, 
black veins through the borders but only on the forewing. The hindwing is a clear border like a common blue. We go down to the Adonis blue and it's all the wings have got that border broken by the black veins. And definitely if you see fresh individuals the colour is striking, absolutely incredible. The female Adonis blue looks an awful lot like a chalk hill blue and that causes all sorts of trouble. We'll worry about that next time because I haven't put the chalk hill blue into this presentation because they're not going to fly until probably the beginning of July. So common blue underside, sort of greenish blue colour here, slightly bluer, but I would suggest try not to have to be in the position where you're separating common blue from Adonis blue by the undersides, it's very difficult. If you can't see like this specimen, it's just possible to see the veins breaking through the borders. Try to get a look at the upper sides if you can, which are very obviously different. But the, the margins, of course, wear, this one you can see is wearing, so eventually it might be that you'd see something where you couldn't tell whether the veins go through the margin because they've worn off. Um, in which case, it's often difficult to tell these two apart. But most of the time, in most of the Chilterns, you are not going to see Adonis blue. It's pretty scarce and only breeds at three locations that we know of in the Chilterns. Purple High Street, Holly Blue. We're right near the end, folks. You've done very well if you've stuck it out and you're still managing to listen. This is the purple hair streak, which is really obviously purple in the male and there's the female a bit less purple but beautiful you don't often see them like this because they're normally up in the top of a tree sitting on a leaf as these are with their wings open to the sky and you're down on the ground peering up and all you can see is just the tip of the wing sticking out where you'll see this part so at that range at the top of a big tree and they feed on oak the caterpillars eat oak so we're talking you know perhaps 30 meters up tiny butterfly, it's quite easy to confuse or be uncertain of whether you're looking at a pale purple hair streak or a holly blue, which doesn't feed on oak but is quite happy to sit at the top of an oak tree on its way around the wood looking for other plants. And I would suggest the only way you can be relatively sure is if you get a glance and you can see this white line here. Or, if you're lucky, these eye spots, but obviously at a long distance, they're more difficult to see. But that white line separating these two shades of grey is often visible at a very long distance. Whereas this is a uniform white on the underside. At distance, you won't be able to make out these little black spots. But you will make out that white line on the purple hair streak. Um, when they're flying around, they look very similar colours up against the sky, although this one is obviously purple when it settles and you get a look at it, and this is obviously blue when it settles, come on internet connection, come back, the difference when they're flying is really hard to tell, but when they settle, you can see that white line. Okay, very last little bit, this isn't going to be a problem for many people, there are a few places in the Chilterns where you can see white letter hair streak. And some of you might go to locations in north of Bucks or the north of Oxfordshire where you can see the black hair streak. So most of the Chilterns, you won't see either of these because they're both very scarce. But if you do have a, a patch to look after, to look at, to record, where there are elms, you might see white letter hair streak. And we're looking for the black line inside the red band here, which has changed during the evolution of a black hair streak to become a separated a series of separated black blobs. So the black hair streak has got these black blobs and the white letter has one line, which is a dreadful pronunciation, supposed to be Spanishy sounding, a single black line and inside it, not always visible, this white W has a slightly deeper W part 
who are saying how uh, they're struggling for finance at the moment. And so if while people are finding all this helpful, they ever think to themselves, oh, we wouldn't mind joining Butterfly Conservation or making a subscription or a donation to Butterfly Conservation, that would be very welcome. But that's the end of the plug. Now fire away with the questions, please. <laughs> 